Welcome to the five. Today is August 9th and here are the five things you need to know today. The climate is changing even faster than we realized. The COVID vaccine approval from the full FDA approval could be coming within weeks. Fewer baseball fans tuning in than in previous years. A back to school shopping update and a $2 million 36 year old video game. And joining me today on my right has been as always. So let's get started. The first thing, so the climate is changing even faster than we initially realized. Uh, most reputable scientists are aware that this has been going on for some time, yeah. but it's been happening now even faster than we have realized with yeah. the warming. So the, let's see, so the world has rapidly warmed 1.1 degrees Celsius higher than pre-industrial levels, which is now going at faster speeds up to 1.5 degrees. It doesn't sound like a lot, yeah. but if you notice like wildfires and earthquakes and droughts and yeah. floods, yeah. this is all climate change. It's not just like hot and cold, it's more extremes and more yeah. things that used to be rare just becoming more common. Yeah. Uh, what do you think? I think there tend to be more weather disasters and a lot more, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. A lot more things that are just out of the normal with you know, where places we're getting a lot of, get, they don't usually get a lot of snowstorms yeah. are uh, places that are not used to the heat are getting a lot more heat. There's some places in the United States that they're not even used to dealing with uh, needing a, an AC unit. Yeah. And now mm -hmm. they're like, we need AC units now. Like that just goes to show that uh, something is changing. Obviously there's yeah. something and it's not good either. And I mean, and you just gotta take their word for it. If you got all of these scientists saying that like, hey, our climate is changing and mm -hmm. it's going to get worse and we're like running out of time. We need to do something. I think we need to kind of, I mean, and it's evidence because we can clearly see it yeah. in the news every single day. I don't even know what there is to argue, but I know there's a lot of people out there that still don't believe it. Yeah, so uh, to gain some context to how climate change has really increased the frequency yeah. of out of the ordinary, things. So droughts globally uh, normally would occur about once every 10 years and now are happening 70% happening more frequently. Uh, six of the 10 largest fires in California have occurred in 2020 or 2021. Mm -hmm. So like all these patterns are just increasing with these extremes. Flooding, let's see, 200 people were killed in Germany and Belgium when more than an entire month's worth of rain fell in 12 hours. Wow. Uh, it's, it's just these things are crazy. And oh, but there's a, the, where's the one? Yeah, the, I don't have the exact one here, but there's these reservoirs like in the Western half of the US that provide so much water to so many people, like yeah. they're falling to really dangerous levels or be like, oh, I guess we don't have any water now. It's, yeah, it's nuts out there. It's really sad. The fact that, and this is not new either. I mean, they've been taught from since like the early, yes. early 2000s. I mean, this has been like, you know, as far as I can remember, that's just me. I'm sure these been talks have been going on longer than that, but like, I mean, just decades of talking about this and yeah. them constantly warning us that we need to do something and the fact that it keeps getting ignored and, and debated and, and, and everything, it's just kind of sad that now it looks like we could be approaching to a, a state to where it's too late. Yeah, and, and that's what they're saying, like, it, like if you don't change now, or it already could be too late yeah. before these dramatic things happen, it, it's... A lot of, it seems like most people that, like it's hard to argue things are happening yeah. or, or have happened, but I guess some people still don't believe that like our actions are causing them, Yeah, which is just a, another crazy <laughs> side of people that choose not to believe in facts. Right. I'm not, I'm not so convinced <laughs> that this is because of us. Yeah, let's see. So looking back, so uh, 1995, the, so with these uh, IPCC, a bunch of smart scientists group. Uh, the ability to connect climate change to human influence is currently limited, of course, 26 years ago. Yeah. 2001, newer, stronger evidence that warming is due to greenhouse gas emissions. 2007, global warming, global warming is unequivocal and there is high confidence that human influence is to blame. Uh, they say 2013, warming of the climate system is unequivocal and human influence in the climate system is clear. And 2021, it is unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean, and land. 
<laughs> I kind of get not yo yeah. In these events, the uh, ice sheet collapses. The thing too, like polar ice caps and melting. Melting. And the yeah. other, uh, if you live in low spots around the coast, you're probably going to notice you're that water flooded. rising eventually. Yeah, you're yeah. going to get flooded out. I mean, they're talking about how a lot of cities now may not even exist. But what, like Miami, like <laughs> New York, like Tampa. Uh, <laughs> yeah. New Orleans is already low and already got flooding issues there. Yeah, they can't afford a couple feet more of water. It's already below sea right. level as it is. So, what do we learn from that? Take it seriously. Yeah, at least, at least take it seriously. Yeah, at least take it seriously, and then just you know, read into it and see what you can do. You know, to change everything, and and then vote also vote the right people in that are actually going to take this seriously yeah. to make those changes. You know, mm -hmm. because. You know, if we have a government that is opposing it, there's only so much you can do. Yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. So, you're yeah. still right. And speaking of people choosing to believe or not believe facts, uh, there is another uh, that's a COVID vaccine. Seeing an article here, uh, one of the barriers to getting people vaccinated has been this emergency authorization versus full FDA approval, because it's it's easier for places to mandate it, such as schools when things don't have the, because schools have been mandating vaccines for years. Yeah. So it, that's not a new thing, mm -hmm. but emergency authorization versus full FDA approval, Yeah. hopefully it will help. And they, they're saying maybe within the coming weeks that might be full FDA approval, yeah. which would really help. I mean, with vaccine hesitancy to begin with, as well as people more, like if your organization, you're a little more willing to mandate it if it's yeah. fully FDA approved. And yeah. so maybe that'll help. Yeah, I mean, something that's like actually studied and actually like analyzed by healthcare professionals and given the okay compared to like, we got to get this out right now. Everybody's yeah. got to take it, you know, with with little data. Yeah, if you compare those two things, it, it totally makes sense to like now the fact that it's getting approved should make people feel more confident yeah. of, you know, being okay after getting the shot. And especially as school stuff is coming yeah. along here, that's it's yeah. started for a lot, for some people, coming soon for most everybody else. I guess a whole real thing, let's see, they're working, FDA working around the clock on the, if, on the COVID-19 vaccine, mm -hmm. and they are, as they repeatedly remind people, an independent organization that no one can just lean on and say, get this approved. Mm -hmm. Let's see, so with the, so for some context here, so to qualify for an emergency use authorization author, which is under right now, the maker submitted the vaccine maker submitted three months of clinical trial data, which included two months of safety data on fully vaccinated since most vaccine side effects occur two to three months within two to three months after the vaccination. Uh, but the it's more involved for the full FDA approval. Let's see. Uh, so on some random poll, three in ten on vaccinated adults that they'd be more likely to get it if they move to full approval. That doesn't really mean yeah. anything in and of itself, but that right. but every every person do, does help. I like how they would use the word likely. More, more likely. likely. I think about it more. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> not saying I would do it and that's not even Yeah. Let's see, yeah. So what a strange thing with the vaccine. We talk about it all the time. It's such a strange thing yeah. to have this thing and People that are choosing, that are eligible and choosing to not get the vaccine, they are the problem. Yeah. They are what makes it harder than everybody else. Yeah, and those are the people that people are really not as worried about as much anymore. I hate to say it, but like, yeah, we want to, we care about all people. We want everyone to be safe and stuff like that. But right now, like, a lot of people are just like, let's get these kids taken care of. Well, how do you help someone that doesn't want to help themselves? Exactly. Like, you really, <laughs> well, and it's like, and then how do you feel bad about them too at the same time? Because it's like, uh, yeah, okay, yeah, you don't want anything bad to happen to anyone, but at the same time, like, if they're not willing to take the steps necessary to protect themselves and protect the people around them, then it's like, uh, they're kind of shooting themselves in the foot. You can't make some, you cannot make someone do something they don't want to do. So, uh, ultimately, that's like me, it, I'm not taking any responsibility just because you decided to not get vaccinated, you know, it's, yeah. uh, it's just the way it is, like, that's, why I am not, I'm totally against any kind of closures or any kind of layoffs or any kind of, you know, I say, you know, wear your masks and social distance. But other than that, there's really not much we should do, honestly. Mm -hmm. Right now, I'm just more worried about the kids. Yeah, people, that it's because it's 12 and up is yeah. the eligible one. So people like us, kids under, under 12 mm -hmm. and eligible at this time. Although I think 
2020, I know we're in 2021 now, but 2020 I think was a really good lesson for a lot of people and a reminder for people that even already knew that just how malleable and well-adjusted 99% of children are. Yeah. Because all, all my people never wear a mask. We were wrong about that. It was the adult that didn't want to wear a mask. Right. All these things that were going to traumatize kids forever, nothing really ever happened. No. Like, they, they seem to be yeah. fine with it. Oh, I guess, I guess I'll go to school half a day now. I guess I'll learn from home. I guess I got to wear a mask all day. Yeah. It's just almost like a non-issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. it's a good lesson because all the people that said their kids would never wear a mask, I think were ones that didn't want to wear one themselves. Yes. I think it's like the projecting. Yeah. And using mm -hmm. that as an example. And that's just unfortunate. Like I know my son, he wears a mask everywhere he goes and he wants to, like we don't make him, he just does it. So, and, and that's the way it's gonna be in school. But, you know, ho hopefully like, you know, we figure out something to where um, real soon that kids his age can get vaccinated and er everyone can be safe and stuff. Cause that is really, that's still the concern. Cause uh, like I was about to say, it's safe for kids that are 12 and older, but not younger, so. It's like, we still got to take that part seriously. Yeah. And I, I think it's been kind of interesting as like Delta's been, Delta variant been working its way around and more places of various, whether it's businesses or states or cities, counties, like kind of forcing these. And I think it's going to be a, an interesting level because people are starting to mm -hmm. and will continue to be just put against inconveniences, yeah. uh, to put it lightly, to, yeah. to choose to not get a vaccine. Because it's one thing to be like, oh, I can't go in that restaurant. It's gonna be something else to say, my employer vaccinating, yeah. mandating vaccines, am I, do I feel strong enough about this to find a new job? Yeah. Or am I just gonna suck it up to make my life keep moving? Right. And I think people are gonna just find more and more of those hard choices. Yeah. And people that are super, super anti-vax might be, oh, I do need a paycheck also. Yeah. So they do, might have to do you think to pick there which one they really sense, care about. There's a false sense that this is gonna go away. That and that's what people are holding out for. They think like, oh, this is eventually COVID is just gonna disappear and I'm not I'm not even gonna even have to get the vaccine and I'm gonna be completely okay. Me, I'm under the I'm just this is not going anywhere. Yeah, places in the world, so that's a that's a great point to bring up. Uh a lot of like smaller countries that have more I don't know, more manageable border situations and population sizes. Yeah. Uh, initially, we're like this whole zero COVID, like one case, let's shut it all down, are realizing that that is not a doable strategy. It, and yeah. it's, it's, so I think most places in the world, and I think it is, it is reality. Yeah. And it's not so much like, can <laughs> we eliminate this? It's how can we coexist and have this yeah. thing not demolish the world? Yeah, I think honestly, that's the discussion now because I think now it's, it's just becoming a, I talk of how can we live with this? How yeah. can we cope with mm -hmm. it? Because it's not going to go anywhere. Yeah, you can shut everything down and everyone can stay at home for three months, but you're really just delaying the inevitable. Because yeah. mm -hmm. when everything starts back up, then it just starts all over again. So it's, and we now have data that back that, that backs yeah. that information up now. So we kind of know that that's not really effective anymore. So I think now the mindset is just how can we live with it? Yeah. I think a lot of it, like, so a lot of people said it was just like the flu, which it was not. But I think in five years from now, it's yeah. gonna feel like the flu, like, oh, yeah. I got COVID again. You get your shots, which don't make it go away, but make symptoms better. Mm -hmm. And then it's, and not starting as treatments, cause like Tamiflu, which helps treat symptoms. P people go to the hospital and die from the flu, unfortunately, yeah. but that's not most people's primary concern when they get the flu. Yeah. And it's a much more thing with COVID. So as treatments evolve, as well as vaccines, mm -hmm. not start from scratch, just evolving each year and it becomes more of a normal thing. Mm -hmm. I think I think in five years from now, it's gonna feel like the flu. Yeah. Just like, oh, COVID season again. Right. <laughs> Let's right. get your booster shot this fall. Everybody can yeah. get your COVID shot. Really, the only thing that's preventing normality is vaccinations. Get mm -hmm. the vaccinations up, get higher percentage of, you know, of that, and I think that's really yeah. the only way to do it. Mm -hmm. And I think I, everyone's speculating, but whenever it becomes time for kids to be able to get it, I think that will also really, really push in that direction because yeah. while you have a lot of parents and be like, oh my kids, we're gonna get, get a vaccine. Mm. A lot of parents also said they would. Yeah. <laughs> and at least then, because part, that's part of the problem, right? It's like if other people, like, I, I care about humans, but yeah. I care about my family more. <laughs> and if other people <laughs> wanna get COVID bad, that's not, 
a serious concern of mine. Yeah. But if those people are going to give it to my kids and they'll get far more yeah. serious symptoms before they can get the vaccine, that does become a problem of mine. Yeah. And so I, I guess when people can at least protect their children, which is parents pretty high on their list, most decent parents, I'd say, like they, they would probably be far less worried. At least, at least my family's protected and those people that don't want to get the vaccine, they can have their own problems. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, who knows? That was a big rant. So third on the list, uh, taking a turn here. So fewer baseball fans are tuning in than have in the last pre-pandemic season. Yeah. Saw a drop of about 12%. And as a non-sports viewer, but as a as a streaming aficionado, I suppose, and mm -hmm. someone that cares a lot about money. Yeah. We've talked about it before. It's more expensive than never has been before, I think, to be a sports fan. It really is. And I, I think these streaming services and um, and all this exclusive right stuff to who gets what is to blame. Because yeah. I think they're realizing that most households are not going to pay for every streaming service yeah. under the sun. They're just not going to. In fact, they're going to get so overwhelmed that they just might say, heck with it all, mm -hmm. you know, because... Um, and then I think that's what's to blame because in like in our area in, in, the, in the Midwest with you know with the Cardinals and stuff like that you can only watch the Cardinals if they're on Valley Sports well guess what Valley Sports is only available on one network so if you have anything else if we have any other way to you know you won't be able to watch it so but are you going to uh, get rid of some of your favorite shows or your wife's favorite shows just so you can watch a baseball game probably not and that's not even like sign up for a new streaming service that's changed your whole provider yeah yeah exactly so so bali claims they say of it is uh a big part of that they say they intend to go direct to consumers yet another streaming service but in 2022 yeah. so if that happens mm -hmm. at least that gives people a more reasonable option here's yeah. your, your ten dollars a month where you can watch all the games you want yeah. in theory but it, we'll it, see what happens it's just that. one of those things it's like you, people have to make decisions now because like okay you want to watch the office well you got to watch peacock mm -hmm. that's 10 bucks a month you want to watch stranger things that's on netflix that's a 15 dollars a month and you know if you that keeps adding up and then later on you got to decide like okay well, what can i go without mm -hmm. and and then maybe because of you know with the with the shortened season and and everything and just because it's so expensive to watch like because you have to pay for a whole cable provider mm -hmm. people might just be like you know what i am i'm through i'm yeah. not watching it as much i'm not as interested because uh because and out of a household usually it's not the whole household that's into sports it's usually yeah. the dad or the son and stuff like that so you know they got to come up with um with a compromise that who can watch what or you know what's good for everybody and then i think honestly the, the the subscriptions that cost the most are the ones that are going to get well you used to see like when when streaming first became a thing it was like netflix yeah. and you can do this and people are thinking oh it'd be nice now to not have to get like 25 channels for the one show i want to watch yeah and that seemed true for a while but now it seems like it's becoming the same exact problem yet again. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of like how, how many streaming services do I have to get to watch the two shows I want to watch? Yeah. And in fact, actually, it's it kind of it's kind of gotten worse because now, like, okay, back in the day when you had cable, you could watch everything that was on M NBC, everything that uh, there was like the Disney Channel, there was, you know, there's Fox and stuff. But now, like, NBC is going towards like the Peacock route. That's now that's a whole different service. You got Fox and Hulu and Disney Plus. Those are two different, and you can get those bundled now. Yeah. But still, those are two different things mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Now it's like basically channels are just becoming their own streaming service, and you got to pay fifteen dollars per yeah. one. So now and now it's kind of getting a little worse, and then now that's why I think people are starting to realize that like. Maybe it is better just to go with the cable and stuff. But then again, that's even more because that could be like 75. That's like three streaming services mm -hmm. stacked on top of each other. So I don't know what what the answer is. I think that's just an individual problem, honestly. It's like, what do you want to watch and what can you go without? And what is the, well, and, and, I, and I wonder like eventually, yeah. eventually down the road, because I think that's going to be hard for consumers to deal with mm -hmm. this pattern like nonstop of like, here's one more streaming service, one more thing. Mm -hmm. I, I makes me wonder if like 10 years down the road from now, yeah. if there will be like some Spotify 
ish type solution yeah. where at least you could you pay more but at least it's like everything you actually want to see instead yeah. of having to piece together one after the next after yeah. the next you, yeah maybe you can maybe al you can almost you could almost argue that we went backwards that we've kind of declined because like the way it used to be even with movies like you used to be able to go to a movie store and you don't worry about exclusives mm -hmm. chances are the movie you wanted to watch was going to be there unless it was a new release and it was a friday night then it wouldn't be there but anyways but you could be able to get any movie there pay a couple dollars watch it one night and then boom that's it you didn't have to worry about like oh but they only have dc movies here i gotta go you know to another yeah. do another town to see <laughs> uh disney movies and stuff like that so you could get everything in one spot then you had cable which got all the channels each network had their own thing whatever and then you were just paying for two different things um now you have to because not every network is that great because yeah. every network will basically have maybe six things that you will watch mm -hmm. and then that's it yeah you know and then you, it basically now you're just kind of like oh well which ones have have my favorites and yeah and it, it, it now is just kind of harder but um i don't know what they're going to do about that i don't think i don't think it's going to get any better if anything it's going to get worse <laughs> i think it's been an interesting lesson in in leverage yeah and who who has the leverage who thought they had the leverage yeah you got a lot of theater chain owner realizing that we thought we had the leverage yeah like, what are people gonna do like well now you know you know what people are gonna do and turns out that yeah you were only used as long as the people with leverage needed you yes and then suddenly exactly we cut you out we sure will <laughs> exactly the only thing the best thing is hopefully these streaming services start partnering up you know you see yeah you see like hulu and disney plus they've already kind of done and espn all owned by disney so that's a no-brainer yeah. there but hopefully you can start maybe we'll start to see where like uh, you get a bundle where if you get peacock you also get hbo max or paramount plus or yeah. apple oh my gosh there's so many well and i think i think too like uh i mean because big mergers do happen yeah but i think what's also been interesting for like the the typical consumer they've also i bet many of them didn't know like there's not that many companies that would own pretty much everything they've ever watched <laughs> Yeah. They're like, well, what's Peacock? Oh, they realize like with Viacom is like CBS, yeah. MTV, VH1, like all BET, yeah. all these things, yeah. Comedy Central, like all rolled into one. Right. And like, I, they, well, like, like, well, what's Viacom? Well, you don't know what Viacom is, but you know what Peacock is. Same deal. Yeah, and they also, I'm pretty sure they own Paramount too, don't they? Don't they? I thought they did. Paramount they, Plus. Yeah. Yeah, I thought mm -hmm. they did. And did I say Peacock? They, all, they say, all roll together. They all do yeah. roll together. So like yeah. Viacom, CBS. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and Viacom so owns them too. Yes, but no, Viacom, CBS, like they own the Paramount stuff. Yeah. Like people know some Paramount from like movie intros, right? Paramount mm -hmm. stuff, but yeah. They had, Cause they had a CBS all access for a while, which is way too much of a yeah. mouthful for a streaming service. But, but yeah, but my thing is though, if you're going to, ex this is going to happen because they are, they're excluding markets a hundred percent. So what happens when you're excluding people, you're going to have less viewers simple as that mm -hmm. you know what makes you wonder though, like less viewers is one piece of the equation yeah but probably revenue and profit is a also yeah because if, if fewer people watch it but those people are are paying more yeah the economics might work out just fine for, yeah for these content holders right yeah that's good yeah that that is very true that's just that's just that's another thing is it's like okay because now the the market has been completely divided now the people that say that they, they do want to watch baseball, they realize that now because they are in the very minority, they're going to, they're going to be paying more. Yeah, so the, so the interesting and, thing, like it's a, it's a business lesson that I never forget, is like if you can have half as many customers and they all pay twice as much, <laughs> you'll make more money. Yeah. Because it's not just clear as dollars and cents, but the infrastructure costs. Yeah. And, people and all these things so that's an interesting lesson because a lot of cus a lot of companies will think if i could we could sell we could have half as many people watch this but make mm, twice as much money per person mm -hmm. it sounds like a no-brainer it does and that, may maybe that's part of what they realize that too. Yeah. yeah speaking of money so with back to school either happening or happening soon for most students in the country uh there are a lot of unknowns in back to school because it seems so certain for a lot of People and now with the Delta variant and all mm -hmm. this stuff going on, people are less sure. And then there's these supply chain issues. But the National Retail Federation pre predicts that consumers with children in kindergarten through 12th grade will spend $37.1 billion 
this year, the most since it started collecting data in 2003. Wow. So record according to that, I mean, things are getting more expensive all the way, all these supply chain constraints, mm -hmm. yeah. no doubt part of that. And as, as a parent of young children, like school supplies are kind of expensive. Yes, There's so are. much stuff they need and they always ask the specific things. And the stuff they ask for is, is always like weird quantities, like mm -hmm. get this with like 36 and a half crayons in this pack, so you have to get bigger or smaller each time. Yeah. That's an exaggeration, but the, the packaging sizes mm -hmm. are always hard to match up with what they say. And yeah. I don't think it's on purpose, but it's just a, because they're they're at the they they say what they want and then people that make those things might not have the same might yeah. not have the same things. Uh, so LL Bean is saying that their back to school item sales are up two hundred percent compared to the same period a year ago. But you can't you can't really compare yeah. things uh, what's the right accurately yeah. to things a year ago when, when there like, was there's, nobody, nobody, there's no vaccine, like yeah. you're going to school, you're staying home, like that's, you can't, it's, you can't really compare to that. Yeah, yeah, it's because it was the most, uh, by far the most bizarre school year of all time. Yes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's hard, why would, I don't understand why they would compare. But yeah, school supplies are expensive, especially if you, I mean, if you have like multiple kids, yeah. that could be, I mean, I don't know, I, I honestly don't know what the average is, but I mean, we spend, about a hundred dollars and that's not even, honestly that's not even real that's just supplies we're not even talking about like clothes mm -hmm. or anything like yeah. that that which makes honestly i think that's where the majority of the cost is is the clothes the shoes the bags everything like this the, the apparel oh my you know they gear them up for the fall yeah it does add up especially if you have multiple kids and this and the supplies and everything because yeah. yes, they always want weird quantities of yeah. everything they always want you to bring in like 12 tissue boxes per kid and that's an exaggeration, but still, they they always want you to bring in so much. So yeah, yeah. it does add up. But back to school, I guess, is in route. My kids start next Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Yours uh, next Friday. You yeah. said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, we'll see how how much this works out because so many of these kids are still in max, and most of the teachers are. Yeah. So at least the school shut down because that was that was a problem at our school last mm -hmm. year was. It's not so much if kids are out, it's they just ran out of teachers and subs. And not yeah. so much from infections, but even quarantines, like yeah. oh, you're shoulder to shoulder with somebody. And that was the, the close, co the, what is it, the close contact guidance has evolved a lot. Yeah, yeah so they, uh, I don't know if you get anything like this with, with your district, but they set something out kind of explaining the, the measures they're taking to keep all the kids safe, as well as, because there was two times last year we had to have our, uh, our son home for, uh, for like a week or something like that because of the close, Contact. close contact yeah. with a confirmed positive case but but i guess it used to be six feet so now it's three feet mm -hmm. so i guess in our district they're saying that you have to have two unmasked people within three feet of each other and then one of them gets confirmed positive to count as a close contact uh, so say like we're shoulder to shoulder but one had a mask on that would never count as a close contact. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was just kind of interesting. They had it outlined very clearly so you yeah. know what to expect, but they said don't expect that many close contacts because in the district we're in, uh, as well as most places in Illinois that are following the executive order, a yeah. uh, mask required. So that would take out nearly all of the close contacts to begin with. Yeah. Uh, well, that's good. It sounds like they're trying to prevent shutdowns yeah. and, and teacher shortages and everything. So that's, that's good. Because that was, I, I would I would argue, we talked about kids earlier and how well adapted they were to nearly everything that got thrown at them. Because we were all worried like, how are kids gonna handle this? I think as a parent, it was far harder on the parents than it was on the kids. Yeah. Because because for us it's like, oh, and like when you go into school now, and I'm, we are more fortunate than most. My job has a lot of flexibility. Mm -hmm. my, my wife uh, pr primarily stays at home. So we have that flexibility more than far <laughs> fewer families that yeah. are like, we gotta, we gotta go to work. How are we gonna have our kid homeschooled now for two weeks or whatever the yeah. case may be? Like that's, we are yeah. more fortunate than most. And I acknowledge that. Like it, yeah. was, it was far harder on parents yeah. than, it was on, than it was on kids. Yes. Yes, it was very taxing on, on parents, everybody. I mean, everyone involved and, and and just the teachers too that had to, I mean, they had to remote teach and teach kids in person at the same time. I bet, I mean, that was, I bet that was very challenging. It was yeah. just a challenging year all the yeah. way around and I um, do not want to repeat that again. With the mountain of, it's it was a good lesson in life where oftentimes you have to, 
you have like three crappy choices and you have to pick the one you want <laughs> out of the crappy choices. Yeah. There were so many times where you, you don't pick out a, it's not like a, well, here's a good option. Like these all suck. Mm -hmm. Which one are we going to pick out of the suckiest options? Yeah. Like no matter where you stand politically, like governors have to deal with that because you know half of the people are just gonna throw a fit, whatever you decide. Yes. And same thing like with school boards and parents and mm -hmm. all these things, you know, half are gonna throw a fit no matter what you say. Yes. So nonstop, just knowing that whatever you do, people are just gonna complain about it. Exactly. I don't envy people that had to deal with choices like that. Yes. Uh, rounding out the five, a lighter topic towards the end, a 1985 uh, Mario Brothers game, or, uh, let's see, where's it at here? Yeah, so 1990, 1985 unopened uh, Mario Brothers game just sold for two million dollars. Wow! Uh, it doesn't say here exactly what it sold for when it came out, and of course there's inflation involved in that. Yeah. But uh, that is a uh, that's a lot. That's a lot for a, a, a video a video game. Period. Yeah. I would never pay two million dollars for any video game, but I mean, especially one. I mean, I get it. Okay, there's nostalgia with this one. The fact that it was. Probably one of the first ones ever made. Mm -hmm. So it, there's some cool facts about it, you know. And if I guess you're the kind of person that can afford to blow two million dollars mm -hmm. on a video game, chances are that that's that means nothing to them. That's absolutely yeah. that's just a drop in the bucket or whatever. But there is no video. I don't even know if there's a video game right now that I would spend oh, maybe maybe 007, Goldeneye, Nintendo 64. I might spend good money on yeah. that, but that's pushing it. That's well, and I think that's it's interesting thing in culture because for so long, people oh like let's get like let's get fancy art, not to downplay fancy art, but that was like a thing. Let's let's have all these like fancy ways to show off yes. how how wealthy we are, so yeah. we can rub shoulders with our with our other rich neighbors. Mm -hmm. And now maybe some of what they show off with has evolved. I'm like, go check out this video game I got here, dude. Yeah, <laughs> and I think. like, it's a, I think interesting part of culture because what's happening right now is you have a generation like, like more older than our generation, but you say probably have like 40, 50 year olds that are now the ones that are starting to have some of this wealth and they're collecting things that are of interest to them. Yeah. And if you were a super wealthy 50 year old that loved video games, mm -hmm. you'd be the kind of person that yeah. would probably get a video game because you remember that was so awesome when I was a kid. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the same thing with like autographed baseballs, mm -hmm. like Babe Ruth baseballs, Roger Maris, or man, you know, you, all, you hear about all the times autographed baseballs going for a lot mm -hmm. of money and stuff like that. I mean, it, it's the same lines and everything. And no matter what, the people that are not as wealthy are always going to look at it and shake their heads like, I wouldn't even spend well, I, $20 on that. And <laughs> you know? I think what but, this is, in my opinion, a kind of representative of is baseball's been around a long time. Yeah. I don't know when the baseball started, but it's been like 400 years, right? Yeah. So, so you've had a couple of generations of people with money that could collect those things. Yeah. Uh, if you're really wealthy, buy teams, if you're that kind of, that kind of wealth. Uh, but I, I would probably say like the, the first generation, because I remember Mario Brothers, I was probably like six. I was a little bit on the young side of when that became a thing. But say I was like 15 and I was hardcore into it 10 years, right? Mm -hmm. Later, that would be, I think it's, so I, I think everything's lining up with people's, the, the what's, what's the word? Nostalgia yes. of when they were a kid mm -hmm. and, the, and the culture thing of the timing. And I think is really what what lends itself to that. Which I feel nostalgia is just getting worse and worse. You ever notice that? You always oh, hear, yes. you see a lot of throwback like things referencing the '80s. A lot of movies are referencing the '80s, and just the it seems like I don't know what it is. There's probably a mental big mental health thing right now that's probably not being talked about enough. But I do feel like there's a lot of people that just wish they could just relive their childhood again. That nostalgia is stronger than ever before. Yes. I it just seems like that, that too. Maybe it's always been the same and I've never paid attention to it. But I just feel like you hear it in the music, you hear it in, in you see it in mm -hmm. movies and stuff. There's a lot of eighties and seventies callbacks and stuff. Um it's it, it's kind of interesting uh People just want to relive their childhood. Nostalgia is so powerful. Yeah. I think about that a lot. So I, I, I figured out a theory because every generation always thinks that their music is is the best. Yes. And uh, I think that's very true that every generation thinks that. And I thought about that one time, and I and I, and I got a feeling that 
if you look at whatever music was popular from when you're about 12 to about 22 years old, yeah. you will always think that is the best music ever. Yes. And I have a theory with that because I think that is probably the most uh, transformative, the formative like years. emotionally, yeah. yeah, good word, formative years. Yeah. Probably fell in love for the first time, like mm. hanging out with your friends on a Friday night, yeah. cruising around, you don't have a lot of responsibilities yes. yet. Uh, and whether college is a thing or not, but like the college age, like and you you bond with the music that you because you can remember the the carefree times yeah. of that and I mm. think that every generation just feels like whatever yeah. when they were like eighteen whatever was cool then they always think is the best yes yeah, back before they had a family and a full time mm -hmm. job and a mortgage or or something you know they but you know when they didn't have any responsibilities and they were just able to go out just do whatever they want and they could listen to their music and party mm -hmm. and be with their friends it seems like they just miss, they just miss those times they yeah. just miss being younger and, and that's and that's the nostalgia you you can mm -hmm. recall like the what that time was like and i love i love my life now but it's drastically different than when i was 17 years old <laughs> yeah and uh, so you, you can just associate with that. Yeah. So I think that's why people always associate, and I don't think that's going to go yeah. anytime soon. And also, we were supposed to have flying cars by now too. Which, yeah. So maybe the future for them is, or, or now is present time has been disappointing. Yeah. <laughs> and, well, I think a lot of people, yeah, what yeah. they what they think their life would have been <laughs> at a certain age. Yeah. It is way, way, way different. It is. And I think that's because you, you kind of have these visions of your mind of what your future is going to entail yeah and then like nearly every time puts you in a different direction you know and yeah you know i used to think that way i used to think like man i missed the 2000s i really miss it but now i'm thinking like well i remember in 2000 i used to 2000s i used to miss the 90s so <laughs> you know i think now yeah. i think everyone's doing that like now because this guy i think 20 years from now people are going to be like man i really do miss maybe not they not 2020 but people might miss 2021, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it's just like, you know what? Yeah, like just enjoy life now, you know, because uh, eventually you're gonna miss the time you're in now. So it's just like, you know, life goes on, it goes forward. So you just gotta have to. <laughs> Last night, yeah. uh, my wife and I, we watched the Office series finale. Mm -hmm. Her first time, I've seen it several times. But there's that scene in there where Andy, Bernard goes, and I'm paraphrasing it from memory here, but he goes, I wish, like, he goes, when I worked here at Dunder Mifflin, mm -hmm. I always reminisced about the good old days in college. Yeah. And like, he, and it was now that I got a different job now, I reminisce about the good old days at Dunder Mifflin. And he said, I wish there was a, was a way to know it was the good old days before they're gone. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. For, for, a, for such a ridiculously strange, funny, quirky yeah, show, it's yeah. a very insightful comment because you always think like, are you gonna look back on now as the good old days while you're right now wishing it was a different time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's why I'd say like time evolves and you don't realize what you're in until it's gone. Yeah. So it's just like, you gotta, I think nostalgia can be a dangerous thing because it, you can, you can do, you can spend so much time dwelling on the past that you forget to live in the moment. And I know that's yeah. such a cliche thing you, true, that you've heard in so mm -hmm. many movies and you hear so many people say, but it's, it's true, so you just gotta have to like, yeah, you can think about the past and, and appreciate the older things, but don't forget to live your life now because uh, there may, there's gonna be, a, eventually there's gonna be a time where you are gonna think that this was a great time too, you know, so. Words of wisdom by Ben Brown. <laughs> that wraps up the five for today. So real quick, as a, as a, we had a couple of digressions today, but climate change faster than we thought, COVID vaccine, full FDA approval, hopefully soon. Uh, fewer baseball fans watching back to school updates and a two million dollar 36 year old video game mm -hmm. sold which got talking about nostalgia yeah uh, ben brown tyler thank you for watching for listening have a great day later yeah.